Jeff is on vacation in Florida with Sandra and the family this week, and so to give you full disclosure, uh, I'm going to say that I'm going to preach this morning the sermon that no pastor likes to preach. So while Jeff is on vacation, I will address the topic. Grateful hearts and generous gifts. I will address the topic of financial giving. But I address it as one of you. I sit in the pew. I'm in the workplace every day. I earn money. I, like you, have concerns to provide for my family. I come to Crossview because I love Crossview, and I love our Lord, and I want to serve the needs, the needs that Jesus is aware of and God is aware of, to serve the needs of our King, to deliver the captives, to preach good news, to use our gifts our talents, our treasures, and our time here at Crossview. There's so much I would want to say, and teachers know and preachers know, when you study, you learn a lot about and you reflect upon it. But I have prepared hard to keep this down under 30 minutes. <laughs> there we go. That's going to be hard for me, those of you who know me, because I know that is the typical adult attention span. So let's begin with prayer. Almighty God, we do love you so much, and many times we don't verbalize that. And we thank you that you have loved us so very much, and you have provided for every need we could have. Material, spiritual, relational, in families and in neighborhoods, and in this church family. You did send your son to leave his place on high, to come for a sinful man to die. And you call us to walk by faith and not by sight, for we can learn your will through the scriptures, but we really don't know what each detail of your plan is. So you call us to walk by faith, to be children of the promise, by faith to go where the church should go, to preach good news and deliver captives. And as we prepare our hearts this morning to look in your word that is sharp and living and alive, May it be an encouragement to our hearts today that you are present with us and that you will guide us and lead us and you will speak to us and you will encourage us to walk in that faith. And we pray this in the powerful name of our Savior Jesus, who is at your right hand interceding for us this moment. In his name we pray, amen. On July the 31st, 1929, a young boy was born in a small rural town in the Midwest. He grew up during the Great Depression. He enlisted in the Marine Corps. He served two different tours after a break in service. But it was in 1959, at the age of 29, that he eventually found his niche. He used his tremendous work ethic, and he began to build a career that would eventually last the rest of his life. You see, he was, and to this day, a true patriot of our greatest generation. I recently visited with him last weekend. Yes, you guessed it, he's 90 years old. And he told me, on four separate occasions in his very long life that he was on the edge of going flat broke, being penniless, going into bankruptcy, having to tell his wife 
and his children. He went on with a story, and he said, Barry, on one specific occasion, after I built my company to its largest payroll ever of 120 employees, in 1982, the economic downturn hurt me so bad. I had to start over from scratch and rebuild. And he went on to say that he did this on four successive occasions. Start over and rebuild, start over and rebuild. What persistence and perseverance. He's now 90 years old. He's sharing this with me. So he knew what it was like to be in plenty with 120 employees and to be in want and need, facing hardship and now on the verge of bankruptcy. But it's because of his life and his example and his abundant generosity through the years to Melanie, his niece, and to our family and our four children that Frank Margarone, Uncle Corky, has become a wonderful role model to me. He has modeled what generosity should look like. What does it mean to give generously to others? To look beyond self to the needs of others. To have a willingness to give and to share liberally and unselfishly. If you haven't seen by now, he has touched my heart. Even though he was a Marine. And I have a strong affection for Uncle Corky. And so does my wife. And so do our children. And he has taught me that money is an expression of your heart. And he has taught me to give liberally and generously out of my hard-earned money. So today, I want our focus to be on continuing down the road that Brother Alonzo shared with us and Pastor Jeff has taken us to. Brother Alonzo said at Crossview, and he shared his testimony of this climate for growth when he shared from Mark 4 in the parable of the seeds and the persistence and the perseverance. And Pastor Jeff shared in Mark 4 as the disciples were journeying with Jesus in the boat trying to get across and and there was opposition. And they were in the boat with Jesus on a journey to get to where ministry needed to be done. To go where Jesus wants us to go. So how do we get there? What will help Crossview keep our climate for growth to go where God wants us to go? I want you to turn with me to the book of Philippians. And let's examine how the Philippian believers responded to the gospel of Jesus and responded to spiritual ministry. Follow along as I read from Philippians chapter 1, the first eight verses. And I want you to notice the heart attitudes and the sentiments presented in this passage. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God. Every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. Why? Because of your partnership, your fellowship in the gospel. When? From the first day. When? Until now. Being confident of this, he began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 
It is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. For whether I'm in chains, now in prison, in Rome, or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Wow. What attitudes and sentiments did you notice? Joy. I feel this way. I have you in my heart. I long for you with the affection of Christ. There is a warm fellowship, a two-way relationship between Paul and between the Philippian believers there in the Philippian church. I like to call the Philippian church the first Christian missionary alliance church in Europe. First church. Why? Because they were not Christians and they became Christians. And then they joined with Paul to do what? To have a missionary alliance to send Paul out. First Christian Air Missionary Alliance Church. And what was this relationship? Togetherness, sharing, thankfulness. What was Paul thinking while he was in jail, in prison? He was thinking of others. Not getting out? No. He was not thinking about getting out. He said, because I'm in prison, the gospel is advancing. On the contrary. He was thinking of others, not self. So what do we read? We read, why was this relationship proceeding? Because of the partnership, the fellowship, the joint ownership in gospel advancement, like Randy led us, to send the church to go. An overwhelming sense of gratitude Paul had for the work of God's grace in his own life. And an overwhelming sense of gratefulness of what God had accomplished in the lives of those believers in the Philippian church. So, let's do a little historical lesson. How did that happen, this relationship? First, the church was founded in AD 50 by the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey. He was going to Rome, and you remember you heard the Macedonian call, and he went over to Macedonia. Let's see if I know my map of Europe. He's going to Rome, but he got called to go to Macedonia, up toward Turkey. On his second missionary journey, he visited back in A.D. 55. Then he sent Timothy and other helpers uh, in the church to help support that church. There was gratefulness in Philippi because of the ministry of Paul and Timothy and the helpers there. Secondly, there was the gratitude of Lydia, the first convert, the seller of purple, the business lady, a wealthy woman. She couldn't worship in a synagogue. There was not a synagogue. There weren't 10 Jewish men present in Philippi, so they had to worship by the river. And Paul goes, and then he presents the gospel. And the Lord opened her heart, Acts 16 says. And how did Lydia respond? Well, thank you, Paul. God bless you as you go on your journey. No, she invited Paul and Silas into my house and stay after she and her household were baptized. Come to my house and stay. Immediate gratefulness and hospitality extended. Well, then Paul and Silas were thrown into jail. Uh, they uh, went about, they saw the slave girl had a demon. Uh, uh, her masters were profiting from it, and they cast that demon out, and the slave girl commanded that spirit out. Slave girl came to faith. They were thrown in prison, and then what happened? The Philippian jailer. They were singing hymns. The jail started rocking. The Philippian jailer was suicidal. He took out his sword, and they intervened. intervened. And he said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas led him to faith in Christ. He and all his household, the passage says. What did the Philippian jailer say? Get back into my jail. 
No. He said, come to my house. He and his household, all were saved and baptized. He come to my house and enjoy my food and let's celebrate his thankfulness. What a start to a church. The Philippian church thrived. Who was there? Were they the elite of the Philippian? Were they the Jews? No, there weren't very many Jews there. There was racial, ethnic, and financial diversity. An Asian, a Greek, a Roman, a business lady, a slave girl, and a jailer. Wealthy, poor, maybe fair in income. And then we we read that the church grew to elect overseers and deacons, grew considerably as Paul introduced his letter in A.D. 60, and they become missions-minded. They supported Paul from the start. We read, from the very start, you shared with me in the gospel ministry. So, where there are grateful hearts, Ministry thrives. Where there are grateful hearts, ministry thrives. But not only does ministry thrive where there are grateful hearts, but also where generous gifts are given. You saw the gifts of Lydia and the Philippian jailer. Let's look at the close of the letter, Philippians 4, 10 through 20. I want you to observe the generosity of these believers. Paul is writing 10 years later in prison, A.D. 60. And he gives a little summary of their generosity as he writes this letter 10 years later. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you really had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned whatever circumstances I am in to be content. I know what it is to be in need, like Uncle Corky. I know what it is to be in plenty. I've learned that secret of being content. And in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through Christ, through Him who strengthens me. Yes, it was good of you to share in my troubles. You have sent Epaphroditus. I'm in prison. You're sharing in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, early days when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, a hundred miles away from Philippi, you sent me aid. And again you sent me aid while I was in need. I'm not looking for a gift but I'm looking for what may be credited as profit to your spiritual account. I receive full payment, even more. I'm amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you have sent. They're a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice. You have sacrificed, Philippians. I know it's not easy from your lifestyles to give, but It's an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Did you observe the generosity of those believers? The Philippians gave from the very start. Church founded in A.D. 50. He's writing 10 years later. Believers that... Philip at Philippi gave immediately when they knew there was a need. They didn't wait. They didn't check. They gave out of grateful hearts. Why? To advance the gospel, which they personally benefited from. Paul departed Macedonia. He traveled 100 miles to Thessalonica. And then, item C, Philippians gave to the Thessalonican ministry twice. 
looking beyond their own needs to the needs of others. No other church shared or partnered with Paul. And then, in A.D. 60, while writing this epistle, the church sends one of their very best from Philippi to Rome, all across the kingdom, the Roman Empire, to Rome, Epaphroditus, with a gift for Paul. Who were these people? These unselfish, sacrificial givers. Matt Harmon wrote a commentary in 2014 on Philippians, and he writes that the vast majority of the population of 10 to 15,000 people in Philippi were slaves. They were service providers. They were peasant farmers. They lived a hard life. Now, it was a Roman colony on the outpost, so you had Roman soldiers who had retired. They were given grants. So there was a small minority of retirees, military retirees. And they kind of interacted with the elite. 40% were probably Roman citizens, 60% non-citizens. Most all of them spoke Greek, probably. But not met very many Jews where Paul could go to the synagogue and preach. They didn't have a synagogue. Generous givers with grateful hearts transformed by the grace of God through salvation in Jesus Christ. Who partnered with the Apostle Paul to advance the gospel. Believers who gave as a priority Believers who gave whatever percentage they could of their income to the gospel. Believers who gave progressively over time as they grew in their faith. We have such a partnership at Crossview. The Claysons are in Jordan. We partner with them in the advancement of the gospel. The Armisteads were here, Jean and Michelle, and they're in China. Johnny Cochran and his wife Alicia, they're the parents, the Nevises, we give to the Great Commission Fund. We are partners together in ministry here at Crossview. What a wonderful testimony. These, I love this book. So by way of application. Stay on that slide. Ministry thrives with grateful hearts and generous gifts of love. Do you agree? You agree? Uh, my friendship with Uncle Corky has thrived because of his generosity to me and Melanie. And you can say in your heart, those who have been generous with you have really transformed your own heart. For ministry at Crossview to thrive, we need believers with grateful hearts to give generous gifts of love for these following ministry needs. The elders and leadership have asked me to share with you our ministry needs here at Crossview. And I would like for you to read that. And I'm going to come down and I'm going to join with you because I'm in this together. Our total ministry needs for this year is 186,000. And those people closest to us, Pastor Jeff, Abby, Randy, and Josh, who are valuable part of this ministry. You see their salaries in the monthly need. The building and the grounds. The youth ministries that Josh does wonderful touching our youth. The 5% Great Commission tithe that we give to foreign missions. We are missions minded. And the district the district office oversees 90 CMA churches, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina. They have operating budget. We give 5%. Our church administrative expenses, and then our own local church ministries, Alliance Men, Alliance Women, our missions conferences, our community, our worship. Our
our average giving has been given with generous givers in our congregation, averaging $11,600 per month this year. Some months have been up, some months have been down. Mary Blaylock is our church treasurer. She just gave me the numbers for July, and it was about 11700 What is our current monthly need? 15400 to fulfill those ministries. Anybody see a mistake there? Yeah, up top it says 15530 and down bottom it says 15400 I, I made a mistake there. It really is the top number. What is our monthly shortfall of financial gifts to accomplish this ministry that we as a church voted on last December and that we have been pursuing? A monthly shortfall of about 4000 per month. This is what is needed to move forward with our ministries at Crossview. God has led us to this place at this time to do his work. And we are all co-labors together with God, brought together by the Lord, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we do not want you to be uninformed. And if you have any questions or any concerns or any suggestions or recommendations, we are open to what you would like to do. So here at Crossview today and in the coming months, what shall we do? You know, I think I made another mistake. As I was pondering this, and you know how pastors at the last minute change their sermon. At the last minute, the Lord said, Barry, this topic is not financial giving. You've got it all wrong. This is not about funds and money and gifts. This is about transforming lives. The Apostle Paul loved the Philippians because they were all into transforming lives. The means is the funds. The mission is the good news and delivering captives and preaching good news and advancing the gospel. That's what this is about. To be full partners together in transforming lives for the kingdom of God. So I thought about how I would end this message and I thought of these things. For three things. First, let us all take a close look at our own hearts for ministry. Our hearts to serve the Lord Jesus, our hearts for our community in Fayetteville, Fort Bragg, and our hearts for ministry for our world. For Hebrews 10 encourages us to let us draw near with a true heart. After that close look, let us examine the ministry needs and the financial resources that is required. Hebrews 10 also tells us, let us hold fast to the commitment of our hope. And finally, let us consider our part of what the Lord would have me to do, what the Lord would have you to do personally, individually, as a church body from this day forward. Hebrews 10, again, let us consider one another. In order to stimulate, to stir up love and good deeds. For we have learned this morning where there are grateful hearts and generous gifts are given, ministries 
thrive. Would you pause with me for a time of meditation on this message? And I'm going to ask Randy to come up and give us some meditation music to take a look, close look at our hearts about the ministry needs, our financial resources, and what God would have us to do.